as a cameraman. All right, so first we're going to talk about why I'm qualified to stand up here and, and talk to you guys about remodeling. Uh, first of all, uh, name Nathan Moore. I have about 20 years of experience working in the construction industry. I'm the CEO of Moore Construction Group, a pretty large outfit out here, um, doing about $10 million in volume a year. Uh, overall, since I've been in this area, I've done uh, about $40 million of construction. So, been around for quite a while. Uh, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Renovated 100 homes last year, over 100 homes. Uh, I also have an undergraduate degree in business administration, a master's in manufacturing and information systems, and uh, MBA. So, went to school for a little while. I like to treat construction as a manufacturing process, so everything runs pretty smoothly and uh, you know, gets done correctly. Uh, and batteries are a little low. Any idea where I'm supposed to point this thing? It's in the box, I believe, um, in the cabinet. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, we'll and see if I can. <laughs> okay. right. I'll, I'll get used to it. All right, so what, what is the purpose of the course? What brings us all here other than continuing education credit? Uh, we want to provide the real estate professional with the background needed to properly advise their clients on remodeling work and contractor selection for the properties that they're looking to list or have their clients purchase. Upon completing the course, agents will be able to advise their clients on the risks of purchasing homes with unpermitted work as well as identify opportunities for their listings to net their clients the highest return. So what that means is that we're going to teach you all about construction contracting as it pertains to the sale of uh, residential real estate. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go over how to identify the different levels of contractors, what the licensing requirements are, uh, what happens if you have a listing that has unpermitted work in it, and how you can get it remediated. And then we're also going to go into a little bit of construction estimating very quickly, just so when clients say, how much does this cost, you can give them some idea. Uh, and then lastly, we'll cover very briefly how to calculate what the return on investment is so you can be a better advisor to your clients to be able to add value as uh, a professional that can not only list their house and get it sold, but also um, recommend an investment for them in renovating the home to net the highest return to them. <laughs> uh, so we're going to go over a quick overview. We're, first we're going to start with the basics. Uh, we're going to talk about the types of contractors, the levels of the contractors, and uh, how to qualify them. Then we're going to go over permitting, uh, when permits are required, how to check if work was permitted, what unpermitted work means to your clients, something that's often overlooked, uh, and then again estimating construction saw cost and uh, determining ROI for construction investment. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so you have the detailed explanation for all of these up here. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit. So basically there's different kinds of trade uh, contractors as most of you know. You have electrical, plumbing, gas fitting, HVAC as well as builders. So electrical contractors are those people who are licensed to be able to perform electrical work in residential and commercial settings and wire um, electrical machinery. Uh, as it pertains to you, uh, they're, they're the people that are going to be taking care of the electrical work in a professional and licensed manner. Um, and and again, most electrical operations require a license in the state of Virginia. Now this class is specifically for Virginia uh, continuing education, but and, and so a lot of the references and the approved syllabus is all for Virginia, but a lot of it is very similar in DC and Maryland. So when applicable, I'll point out the differences or similarities between the different jurisdictions. Uh, also, if you have any questions as I'm going, please feel free to just raise your hand and I'm happy to get things uh, answered for you. So plumbing contractors, same thing. Uh, they, it's, it requires a license in the state of Virginia to perform most plumbing activities. And uh, if plumbing, of course, anything, drinking water, uh, drainage, and uh, any other mechanical systems that require plumbing. HVAC, HVAC techs are usually licensed in um, uh, uh, plumbing as well. A lot of them are licensed in plumbing and gas fitting because they need to run those lines to the HVAC equipment that they install. But you can't take it for granted because a lot of them aren't too. 
So you want to always check the licenses, which we'll go over in a few minutes on how to do that. An HVAC tech is a tradesperson who installs, maintains, and repairs heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and steam distribution uh, systems. Uh, again, they require a license. And actually, it's a little different out here. I'm from uh, the Midwest in Michigan. You can go to most vendors and be able to buy HVAC equipment. Out here, you can't even get your hands on it if you don't have a license. So, um, it, it, a lot of there's a lot of unlicensed work that goes on in, in Virginia, Maryland, and DC. But HVAC is less common because you can't even get your hands on the stuff to, to do it easily without a license. Gas fitting, this is another uh, big one. Gas fitting, of course, you're running natural gas into properties. It's very dangerous. It does require a specific license to be able to be ran, and it's actually a misdemeanor in um, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia mm -hmm. to do unlicensed work on gas lines. So uh, definitely always want to make sure that somebody that's running gas lines for you does have an appro uh, appropriate license. Is it typically a plumber who can also, because my yes. plumber does gas lines. Right, but there will be a special designation on their license for gas fitting, and it does require that they have it. Most licensed plumbers aren't going to touch it if they don't have the license because they don't want the liability, but again, you shouldn't really take that kind of thing for granted. If they, you know, if they don't have it, it can definitely be a problem. All right, so we talked about the different kinds, uh, kinds of trade contractors. Now we're going to talk about the different levels of contractors. So this is, again, just for the state of Virginia. It varies in Maryland and D.C. Um, Maryland, uh, basically, there's a home improvement contractor, and D.C., kind of the same thing. And generally speaking, once you're licensed as a contractor, the levels don't really apply. Um, it, it, again, different states, different requirements. But for the sake of uh, Virginia, <coughs> Class C contractor works on contracts for $1,000 or more, uh, less than $7,500 per contract, and uh, totaling less than $150,000 in a one-year period. Class C licenses, just so you understand what you're getting involved with working with a Class C contractor, you go take an hour-long or two-hour-long class, you pass a test that's incredibly easy, and then they hand you a license. So it doesn't really, it's not really very good screening for who you're dealing with. Um, a lot of people, like your little handyman companies and those types of things, will be Class C, and just make sure that you don't sign contracts with them for over $7,500 because they're not licensed to do work over $7,500. This is one of the biggest violations that you have out here, is that um, you know unlicensed people or Class C contractors will do a bunch of work that they're not licensed for. So when you call your handyman to take care of your home inspection items and there's plumbing and electrical work on there, you know, they're not licensed to do that. So you got that's one of the things you got to be careful about. All of your contracts say that the work is to be performed by a licensed professional. Well, these guys aren't licensed professionals. They need to have that designation for the trades that they're operating in. Um, we can find information about um, factor in the county or something. How I can check? What kind of license? It's a great question. Um, it's a couple, couple slides away. Okay. We'll, we'll get there. Okay. Yes. Our problem is we're provided the receipts like a few days before settlement. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the receipt, it is a general contractor who has done electrical <coughs> and plumbing and H, whatever. you know. And then at that point, what do you do? That's our problem. Yeah, I know, and I, I definitely know. understand it as a problem. We've been working with realtors in the area for about a decade, and um, really, when you when you um, have a situation like that where you're choosing whether to hold up closing or not hold up closing, the only thing that I would say is just advise your clients. You're about to, if you're representing the buyers, um, you know, I'll just advise them and say, look, this work wasn't done, you know, per the contract. If you want to push harder, you know, you could say we need to have our own contractors that are licensed to go do it. At very least, you can or always try to get it. a little credit for them, you know. So, hey, or you guys didn't go verify that it was done correctly. Verify that it was done correctly. Um, but keep in mind, though, to go and verify it. For instance, our company holds licenses in building, plumbing, electrical, and HVAC under our company in Virginia. I mean, and we charge four hundred and fifty dollars to pull each one of those permits. So, if you if you had on your electrical inspection that you know wiring work needed to be done, for instance, even if another contractor did it. Before we even go and look at it, we're going to charge you $450 to pull the permit for what should have been done in the first place. And then you get the county involved, and then they're going to have to go and take a look at it, so you have inspections. I mean, it's a little bit of a to-do. Um, 
So but we anything, don't know about it until the last minute. That's, you don't know about it until the problem. last minute. So, I mean, if, it, again, it, it, it's one of those things that is pretty rampant out here. In Maryland now, they actually can take your license for uh, selling real estate if you refer unlicensed contractors to your clients. Uh -huh. So I, I don't know if that's going to uh, stick here. Maryland has a lot of weird Maryland's rules. Maryland's changed it, I think, October 1st. You only have to do it if it's an MHIC contractor. That's the only one you have to verify? I think starting October 1st. Mm -hmm. And you only have to verify it annually, but they just changed that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, uh, thank you for the update. Um, but, I mean, you still want to make sure that, uh, that things are being done by licensed people regardless and referring licensed people whether you can <coughs> or not. But uh, for your circumstance, I would just advise the client on the fact that, you know, hey, this work was done by an unlicensed contractor. You know, they, I mean, technically they're in violation of the contract that they signed. Yeah, so, but we're so popular when we, at the last minute we say, wait a minute, you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess you just handle it on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and ultimately, too, in the, at the beginning, you can, you can request that information from, if you're on the, the buy side, um, you can request that information from the other realtor to see if, you know, the, the professional they're going to be sending over there actually has the correct qualifications. Yeah, sometimes it's not <coughs> done until the last sure. minute. Right, or you can always say, you know, <coughs> uh, tell the other realtor that's on the other end. Just so you know, it says this in here, we're going to be holding you to this, so we want to, you know, and you can always blame it on your buyers. Like, right. my buyers always want, you know, detailed information about this. They are going to be looking for a receipt from a licensed contractor to be able to handle this work. That's a good idea up front. Mm -hmm. Is the general contractor always a, a contractor of Uh No, so, okay, uh, we'll, we'll get back into this. Because it's looking like a general contractor is only class C, but you can have another class. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. So, so uh, actually, these classes lay on top of the trades classes, too. So, for instance, your electrician could be a class C. None of them are, because they're all going to you know, sell contracts for over 7,500, but, um, and, and if they're licensed electricians, plumbers, HVAC techs, whatever, generally they spent all that time, and I mean, it's equivalent about getting an undergraduate degree right, to get these certifications, maybe even a little harder, uh, depending on the state. They, um, they're not gonna generally do it wrong. They're generally gonna be licensed at the level for volume that they're supposed to be. Uh, but these designations fall for all contractors, general contractors, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, gas okay. fitting. So uh, th this, the Class C license, again, it's just mostly handyman and people not doing that much work, just enough to be able to get their card and be able to be looked up and, and be listed. Uh, so this is one step above people that are just totally unlicensed, but still you just got to be careful about what you give these people to do. Um, basically all they're going to be allowed to do is uh, remove and replace certain plumbing fixtures, um, change outlets, change, you know, uh, anything that doesn't require a, a, a licensed professional to do. Uh, drywall repairs, you know, that kind of thing. But as soon as they start modifying an electrical system or a plumbing system, then it's different and you need to use uh, uh, a licensed uh, tradesperson. So the Class B is the next step up. A lot of the smaller trades companies will be Class B because it does allow them to do contracts up to $70,000. Um, and but less than uh, five hundred thousand dollars in a one-year period. So these guys that are master techs, plumbers, electricians, gas fitters, etc., uh, that are just like a one or a two-man shop, generally they'll only be Class B. Same thing with a lot of the smaller kitchen and bath type remodelers. You know, they're not going to do five hundred thousand dollars in volume. They'll be Class B as well. Um, uh, so. Generally, you're pretty safe on it. It's just understand that the contract can't be over $70,000 to be done under the law <coughs> that they have. And one of the tricks that they've found is they, they'll try to say, okay, well, we're going to sign multiple contracts with you because we have $100,000 of work, so we'll sell you $50,000 and another $50,000 contract. Well, this, this states on to that, and that still doesn't count. Like It's still a contract over. It's about the total volume of work being done. It can't be just broken down by contract like that. And then the Class A is the highest license level that you can have in Virginia. This allows you to do um, pretty much whatever you want as far as dollar volume in the state of Virginia. There's a separate uh, <coughs> designation it's called the BLD. Um, it's a building technical classification that they need to have to be able to do structural work or larger scale projects. Um, our company, More Construction Group, of course, is a Class A with a BLD technical. So 
even if they're a class A, if you have structural remediation work that needs to be done, then you still need to make sure that they have that BLD technical certification. Otherwise, the work that they're going to do, they're actually not licensed for. Um, even if they have uh, an engineer go in and look at it and stamp it, if they don't have the technical um, designation on their license, then they're not qualified to do it and they're not technically a licensed contractor for that type of work, which means that if there's problems down the road, you know, they're, they're not going to be, you're, you're going to be held liable for it potentially. Um, another thing about the Class A is that they have to have a net worth of $45,000 or more. So these contractors, um, they're, you're a little bit more protected when you work with a Class A contractor because they had to prove to the state that they have at least a little bit of liquid, uh, liquidity to them. Whereas if there is an issue, they can afford to, to remedy it, to fix it. Um, and also, I, I don't think there's a slide about it in here, but there is this, uh, re a recovery fund in the state of Virginia for work done improperly by uh, licensed or unlicensed contractors. And it will pay up to $50,000 towards uh, remediation of that type of work. Um, the last class I held, I told the example of the most, um, uh, uh, the worst example of unlicensed work. There was a property out in um, the, the Clifton area, and somebody hired a contractor to take a, a ranch and build it up another story, frame it all in, and so forth. They weren't licensed, they didn't get proper approvals. And then when they did get the permits to, to come in, um, the inspector came out and they condemned it. Well, that was bad enough, but it turns out this is on a um, floodplain and was only allowed to exist at a historic uh, spot. And it was only allowed to exist as it was because it was grandfathered in. So now this house can't be, it's going to be bulldozed or totally left vacant. So the, the homeowner was out. $400,000 for the house plus whatever he put in to pay the contractor to build. And so I consider this to be, in my experience, the most grievous violation of uh, building code that I've come across in the residential sector. Certainly there's worse in commercial. But um, he didn't even get any money from the recovery fund. So I'm not exactly sure who that pays out to. Uh, I'd be very curious to see what is more grievous than not only having the house not be finished, but also now not being able to, because they won't, the, the, the city won't issue another building permit there. They, that, and that's why the contractor tried to pull that, I believe, in the first place, is because they found out that he can't do this big project because it's in a historic protected wetland and they don't issue building permits on that lot anymore. So, just a giant mess. Okay, so back to your question about how to find out if they're properly licensed. It's very easy in, in uh, Virginia. Uh, Maryland, D.C., it's, it's similar, similar, but a little trickier because uh, their online systems aren't quite as advanced for some reason. But you can just go to DPOR, the same licensing organization that you guys use for all of your licenses. Uh, all you do is just type in their business name and it'll show all of their designations, their contractor level, and it'll also show any violations that they have, which is very helpful because if you're working with contractors and you're going to be referring them a lot of business, you want to check and make sure that they don't have a whole bunch of outstanding complaints with the, uh, with the state. And that's by their company name? Or, or by their company name, yes. Yeah. And that's also another thing to be uh, aware of, too. Another thing that people are notorious for doing out here is they'll do business under one entity name, but the license will be held under another entity name, but then your contract says an unlicensed entity on it because the license holder is actually an individual, not a company, and then they, a lot of people do this to kind of defraud people in a way because they do all of this work and they can still pull the permits and they don't. And a lot of times it'll be a similar name, but the entity that holds that um, holds the contract, uh, you know, if you go and try to fight them, then uh, or sue them or whatever, they'll just close that LLC down and then they'll start another one and then they'll do the same thing heard a number of horror stories about that too. So, you know, ABC company, you write a check to ABC company, your contract's with ABC company, it's not the licensed entity. You do have permits on your windows, but it's for, you know, uh, CDF individual or CDF company, then you don't have recourse with the company other than, you know, uh, whatever that company's value is. And oftentimes for smaller contractors, it's just them filing a couple hundred dollar LLC with the state of Virginia. So something to be mindful of and careful of to make sure that whatever it says on the license 
matches the contract that you're signing. Because uh, a lot of times they'll say, oh, well, our license is under this entity. Well, that's great. Give me a contract from that entity. Or probably don't use those people. <clears throat> and then the other thing you want to check while you're on there is to make sure the contractor has an appropriate license level for the contract amount. Don't sign an $8,000 contract with a Class A or a Class C contractor. Don't sign a $75,000 contract with a Class B contractor. Uh, <coughs> you know, just want to make sure that that they are properly licensed for it. <clears throat> and then, uh, possibly most importantly, make sure they have the appropriate trade licensing for the project. Um, now, a general contractor can, uh, with a builder technical uh, uh, certification, can build an addition that contains plumbing, electrical, HVAC. And that's fine. However, and you can sign a contract with them that includes those items. However, what you need to do if you see on their license that they don't have, you know, those designations, then you need to make sure that the people that they're using are properly licensed. So the permits on the on the windows, those companies, you want to check them and make sure you know they're properly licensed for what they're doing for you. And this this isn't something shady. Like very few general contractors are licensed the way we are, where we just hold all of the licenses in house. So most general contractors that you'll work with will have subcontractors that are, you know, licensed in their individual trades. You just want to make sure that who they're using are, in fact, licensed because, you know, if they're not, then that's a, that's a lot of liability. The next thing you want to check is, are they properly insured? Okay. So there's two different kinds of insurances that you'd like to look out for with the general contractors and that is general liability and workers' comp. Now, in the state of Virginia, workers' comp is not required for companies with fewer than five employees. So you can't take for granted that they'll have that. Um, actually, the homeowners can be held liable for people that are injured on site it, for companies that don't have workers' comp. Uh, they, the homeowners can actually be held liable for that. So it's you know, generally advised that you work with companies that do pay for workers' comp insurance, because that way if somebody gets hurt, you know how it is, somebody gets hurt there and they t call an attorney, they're going to sue everybody that they can find. Well, that includes the, the homeowner that was having them work under a company that didn't have proper insurance for them to be covered. Um, now, what, another thing that you want to do, when, when you're, if you're referring a lot of business to a single, con uh, a single contract or a single company, you want to qualify them, right? So, what you do is you say to the contractor, have your insurance company send me a copy of their insurance certificate. Don't let them send it to you, because they, the right way to do it is to get it right from the organization, um, or from the, uh, from the insurance company. Um, I, I, I don't know if you guys have dealt with it too much before, but insurance companies do send, like, if you go, if you go and uh, rent, they want to see the uh, policy from the insurer as opposed to yeah, they don't just trust that a homeowner giving them a sheet of paper saying it's insured. So same thing with the contractors. And then it'll be one sheet of paper. It's really easy to take a look at. It'll show their limits. And under workman's comp, if it's blank, well, that's, that's not great. So, not saying don't use them. I'm just letting you know what, what it covers and, and what the, uh, uh, the liability is when you use contractors that don't pay for workers' comp. And then we'll talk about how to qualify the contractor. So just because they're properly licensed, properly insured, and all of that doesn't mean they're going to be doing a great job for your clients. So you still want to qualify them for the actual quality of the work that they're going to do and the experience that the people are going to have when they're working with your clients because your referrals reflect on you. So the first thing, and the most powerful, generally speaking, is the personal referrals. So if you know other people in your office have worked with an electrician and they're great, you know, that's, that's, that means a lot, you know, especially if somebody's been doing it for years. Great, great way to uh, qualify contractors. Um, internet ratings are more and more popular. Um, they, you know, they also give you a very good indication of how good the company is. Um, you know, it, if people are on the internet and saying, you know, didn't show up on time, made a mess, you know, et cetera, even if they're licensed and insured and, and doing the work the proper way, if they're a giant pain to deal with, that's going to reflect poorly on you. Um, so you want to qualify them in that way. Testimonials are another great way to, to qualify contractors. And then references are nice too, especially to make sure on larger scale projects, you want references from the company to make sure that they've done something similar to what you're having them do. You know, don't hire a kitchen and bath shop that's never done an addition to build an addition. You know, don't, unless they're giving them a fantastic deal or whatever. But 
generally speaking, you want to make sure that you have references for the, that type of work, um, especially with the, the bigger stuff. Or, you know, another kitchen and bath company. Have you ever done a hundred plus thousand dollar kitchen and bath? Or, you know, some very, very high end work? Because if they haven't, you know, you don't want to have your clients be the guinea pigs for it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about when is a permit actually required. Because there is a lot of work that can be done in uh, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. that doesn't require a permit. Um, but it's important to understand what does so you can make sure to advise, advise your clients properly on it. So the construction or demolition of a uh, building or structure, and that's an important note too, the demolition of a structure. If you're tearing something down, that still needs a demo permit. You can actually get in pretty big trouble for that. If you have like a, a shed and you're tearing it down, you have to go to the, the city or the county and get a permit to tear that down. What um, if it's just a portion of a wall? Say. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that definitely needs to be permitted because if you're tearing down a portion of a wall, um, in case it's structural. Yeah, in case it's, in case it's structural, mm -hmm. the county wants to make sure that that's permitted and they'll still want to come and take a look at it. Uh, that's a, one of the things that's very notorious is our company gets called all the time for, well, let's do an open concept, let's take down some of these walls. And they'll have, you know, other quotes potentially from other people or other contractors that told them, oh, no, you don't need to have a permit for that. But believe me, um, if you start pulling out walls in a house or taking out portions of them, changing the load balance, we see lots of things that are bad that happen when you don't do it properly. If you pull out a section of a wall and that wall is load bearing, then you're going to have problems. We see floors, I mean, this is what we get paid to remediate a lot of times, is this subpar type of work. And, um, you know, that, and, and tons of unpermitted work we, we, we remedy as well. Um, Jeremy, our director of operations, could write you a novel about how uh, fixing unpermitted work uh, costs people money. Um, but no, absolutely, if you remove a wall, it, it definitely needs to be permitted. The actual code is if you're moving or modifying any more than one square foot of a wall, then it requires a building permit. So, um, so even the half wall separating a nook from a family room, mm -hmm. ob obviously not structurally load bearing, mm -hmm. still that. Yeah, technically speaking, it definitely does require a permit. So another thing I, I mentioned to these classes too is what the purpose of this class is to teach you the rules, right? So the rules are different than what's actually done in practice and what's generally acceptable in some circumstances. Uh, the example I always use is, technically speaking, installing a water heater does require a permit, just like installing appliances does require a permit. But if you order a water heater from Home Depot, they're not going to pull a permit for your water heater. So that you know, there's there's variations there. So even our company, if you were just pulling down a knee wall that's just unexposed and that was all you were doing, probably we wouldn't go and get a building permit for it. Um, because if we did get dinged on it, the inspector would come out and he would look at it and know that nothing was there. But very, very, very rarely do we do that. We have lots of licenses, and we don't like to risk them by pulling, you know, stupid little things like that. Um, so, uh, yes. So we have to, to ask for the permit to the county, right? Uh, county or city, yes. Okay. And they charge. Have an idea how much they charge for, for go there and give the permit. Uh, if you go pull a permit as a homeowner, most of the permits in Fairfax County are seventy dollars. Um, but they range between like seventy and one hundred and fifty dollars around here. Go there and see. Well, no, no, no. This is, so when you when you have a contractor come out uh, and they'll take a look and you want to do anything that's going to require a permit, they're going to charge you separately to get that permit pulled because they pay the money to have the licenses to be able to do that work. If you just go as a homeowner to try to pull the permit, they'll allow you to pull most permits. Although not, it's been going back and forth about the electrical. Um, electrical, they, they, they I, I actually don't know where it landed at this exact moment. We have a staff permit expeditor that would know better than me. But um, uh, homeowners can pull most permits themselves, but electrical, for public safety, they don't like homeowners being able to pull electrical permits. Uh, it used to be that you couldn't have, homeowners could pull any electrical permit except for heavy up services where you're putting in a new panel and running a new service that would need to be pulled by a licensed electrical company. Um, but uh, at any rate, yeah, they're, they're not too expensive for most of Virginia. Uh, Arlington, they're quite expensive because they charge per fixture. So your permits can be in the thousands. And this is just fees from the county. This isn't, this isn't money that comes to the contractor, generally speaking. This is, this is money that 
you're paying its taxes for any, you know, a lack of a better example. Um, yeah. So, so why is it that it is easier for homeowners to pull permit when they close a permit? It's easier to if a homeowner pulls that permit than if a contractor does. Well, I, mean, I have seen that again and again. The homeowner, they're like, oh yeah, sure, that's okay, and the contractor, whoa. Well, that's a great question too, and the short answer is because we're held to a higher standard as licensed professionals to do things right. Um, actually, it's ironic too, right in the building review part, department in um, Fairfax County, it says building professionals need to have all their drawings submitted on 11 by 17, and, and that's only for contractors. The homeowner could like sketch something out on a bar napkin and turn it in and get it approved. But, um, so how do you feel about contractors who ask you to go get the permit? Well, <laughs> well, first of all, that's just sketchy and should set up all kinds of uh, alarms if, if they're asking, if they're the professional and they're asking you to pull the permit. Um, it's it's a shady thing to do uh, because what it does is it puts all the liability on the homeowner for the work that's being done and takes ex it exempts them from all of the liability for it. It's very common for people that um, aren't properly licensed to do that because what they can then do is that they say, okay, you want to remodel your kitchen? All right, tell you what, we're going to, because our company does charge for permits. We pay lots of money to have these licenses. So we charge $450 to pull these permits. So the contractor will go to you and say, okay, you want to remodel your kitchen? We'll tell you what, we're going to save you the $450 for the electrical permit and you go pull it themselves. Well, then what they do is they have the same guy that's hanging your cabinets wiring your kitchen, you know, and instead of using somebody that's actually licensed or working for a licensed entity on their behalf to be able to do this work. So it's, <laughs> yes, it's, it's generally very inadvisable to work with a contractor that requests that you would uh, pull the permits yourself um, because then you, you lose a lot of the control. And also, the, you know, the quality of work that's being done, you know, isn't going to be done by uh, a professional of that trade. It'll be probably done by, you know, more of the handyman class C thing. So, and, and then understand it. You pull that as homeowner too, and that's another reason why they're a little bit more lenient with it, is because the only person you're hurting is yourself, you know. Okay, so you still have to have it closed up, I mean, just to play devil's advocate. Yes. Okay. Yes, you have because to. in the end, they still come and are going to inspect the work. So if Joe Blow handyman did it. Either they're going to get the stamp or not. Right, and that's and that's true. But if they if they don't, like if you fail, if they if they fail inspection, and they figure out that they failed inspection because they didn't understand the electrical code, and microwaves now need to be on dedicated circuits, and GFCIs need to be on 20 amp circuits, and they need to run that all the way down to the panel, but they only charge you five hundred dollars to do this because they didn't know that. Well, then you they fail the rough, and then they disappear. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's now they know that they have to do way more work than they intended to to get this done. They they don't return your calls. You know they don't go back out and fix the problem. So that's and that's on you because you have the open permit with the county. Now you do have to go find a licensed electrician to go and do the work, and you're going to be paying a lot more for it than uh, what you would have thought because you were quoted by somebody that didn't understand what the full scope is to bring. Because code is difficult. Like. The amount of, it's all for public safety, and the amount of work that needs to be done to get things done properly is, is greater than the amount of work that needs to be done to just get things to turn on. So, you know, if they don't understand code, and they go and do this work, and the scope ends up having to be a lot more to be able to get it up to code. For instance, when our company does that, and they, we, we're expected to know the code because we're licensed for all of these things, we won't be able to come back to you and say, oh no, we have to run all the way to your panel, you know, we're not, we're going to charge you an extra $2,000. That doesn't work that way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just thrilled that you said that microwaves need to be on a dedicated circuit since I've gotten so much resistance from realtors about that over the years. I even had one realtor alter an electrician's receipt <laughs> to say that no dedicated circuit is necessary in Arlington County for microwave, yeah. built-in microwaves. Well, and that's, I couldn't it, believe it. It, it is a very good point, and yes, it definitely is required. However, um, we generally get into this a little later, but um, things are grandfathered in, okay? So that microwave only had to be on a dedicated circuit since, I don't know, the mid-90s or something like that. I don't remember the exact date for the dedicated circuit for the microwave. Um, GFCIs and all their stuff is on the other slides, but um, if the kitchen hasn't been remodeled since before, 
the 90s, then it does it for purposes of selling the house. Uh, when you sell a house at the and the home inspectors are coming and you're trying to, it's, it's the home, purpose of the home inspection is to make sure that everything is working properly and everything is done correctly per the requirements of when it was done. I right? thought it was per the manufacturer's instructions. Well, it's certainly yeah, per the manufacturer's instructions too. But that's where these guys are holding standards like, oh, that's not allowed anymore. Well, it's an older house. Mm -hmm. It's an older, <coughs> yes, it's an older house and it does exist, you know, it, it wasn't renovated. If the electrical system hadn't been modified in any meaningful way in that room, since the time that that code wasn't in force or wasn't in place, then it's fine. But another important fact, uh, kind of uh, laying over all of this, uh, along the lines of what's the actual uh, law, the word letter of the law, and then what's actually done in practice, is um, how much this really depends on the inspector. <laughs> okay. So the the end the end uh, being for the law of what is being done here is going to be the the county or city inspector that comes out. Um, by the letter of the law, if you are installing a new microwave and it's just being plugged into an outlet in the back, then you need an appliance permit, technically speaking, but you don't need to bring the kitchen up to the modern code. However, if it's a hardwired microwave and you're actually pulling that white, and a lot of them are, hardwired microwaves where you're pulling the Romex out of the wall and then coupling it to the microwave, well, now you're now, technically speaking, that does require an electrical permit, and it requires that that entire room, that kitchen, be brought to modern code. So, now, some inspectors will see it, and they'll say, you know, fine, whatever. You know, they're not going to give you a hard time about it. And some will say, well, no, technically this triggers you to need to have, uh, you know, the whole room brought but to modern But even plugged code. in, it's required to be on a dedicated circus. If you circus. do it, if, you've been, if it's been done since that rule's been in place. Again, I don't know the exact date. Um, I, I can certainly look it up and get back to you, but I believe it's it's in the 90s. Jeremy, do you know off the top of your head? Yeah. This was this was when we had walkthrough items that I had to fight. Now everything's negotiable, so. Yeah. Um, is it good? All right, we'll go ahead and uh, continue while you guys are eating. Um, so we left off with when is the permit actually going to be required? Uh, construction or demolition of any building? Um, in D.C., for instance. Uh, unfortunately, some of our, one of our crews got a little overzealous and, and ripped down a garage that was supposed to be ripped down, but um, before the permit wick actually had gone through for the demo permit, and their minimum fine is two thousand dollars. We got fined two thousand dollars, and it put a stop worker or order on our project for I don't know a couple weeks at least. So it's a it's no joke. You have to you have to actually make sure that. It's, um, Yes. Huh. DC's, so a lot of the stuff that we're talking about people get away with in Virginia, very little of it do they get away with in DC. Because DC is much more on their game with uh, making sure they get paid. And, and, and largely it's because permits are only 70 bucks for most things in, in Virginia, whereas they're thousands in DC. And they want their money. Plus, it's a more major metropolitan area. You start messing with their infrastructure, and it causes a lot of public health concerns that are you know, related to more people than just your, you and your single family house. You know, you start messing with structural issues in a row home, well now it's not just affecting you, it's affecting the, the properties on both sides. Um, installations or alterations involving uh, the removal or addition of any wall partition or portion thereof. This is right from the code, so when you ask about removing a wall, that is verbatim what it says in the book. Um, removal of, or addition of any wall partition or portion thereof. So, technically speaking, taking out a knee wall that doesn't touch anything does require a permit. Um, any structural component at all, of course, would require a permit. What and do you in that a wall, a knee wall, a half wall, yeah. or a bar wall, or any, any of those type of language. Um, the repair or replacement of any required component for a fire or smoke rated assembly requires a permit. Also, uh, Fairfax County, I know specifically, I don't know about a whole lot of the other ones in Virginia off the top of my head. It does require you when you pull a building permit to now be wired to code for modern electric, uh, smoke detectors. So that means that they need to be hardwired and they need to be battery backup throughout the whole house. Um, it's not enforced 100% of the time, but it, it is the rule on the books. So if you remodel a kitchen, technically speaking, the contractor should include a price to put smoke detectors per code in the rest of the house. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting rule. 
um, because a lot of times it's a big pain in the butt, you know, hardwiring through all these finished bedrooms and, you know, uh, bathrooms and so forth, but, you know, that, that is what they require. Um, <clears throat> alteration of any means of an egress system. So that means, uh, you know, doors, uh, egress windows, changing those out in any way, shape, or form does require a permit, technically speaking. Also, to be considered a legal bedroom in the state of Virginia, it does need to have uh, egress. And actually, new construction requires egress in basements, regardless of what it's being used for. So, um, you know, and also it's it's good practice too. I'm surprised how uh, rarely it is that we're request or requested of uh, to put egress in in a basement. If there's a fire or something like that, you know, there's it's a code for a reason. Yes. Which means that after October first, two thousand four, I think. Um, any unfinished basement, like if you sell a house with an unfinished basement, you need to tell the person that the buyer that if they're ever going to finish it with a permit, mm -hmm. they need to then add egress. Correct. Correct. I so, didn't know that it was required to be disclosed, but oh, yeah. we don't have to say. That. Oh, you don't have to say anything. Yes. <laughs> I don't. Know. Yes, but certainly finish any any <laughs> any, uh, any permit that we would be able to pull in Virginia to to get a basement. That's a great point. Not only for a legal basement or a legal bedroom, but also to finish it does does require property. But that's, that's important because I see many cases that they don't have any idea what it means bedroom. And they put something which is in the basement closed and say, four bedroom, it's not two bedroom, it's just three. <laughs> yes, that is correct. One of these days I'm going to write in the contract that the seller needs to provide you know, a legal bedroom as yeah. stated in the listing. Yeah, and then you get you get to put in that, that egress window. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an approximate cost for putting an egress in a totally in ground basement? Um, Jeremy would know better than I. Yeah, do. between depending on the the circumstance, between seven and ten thousand okay. dollars. Well, and also it depends on what you want to build. A lot of the egress stuff that we do is different than just like a little barrel. You know, we'll build doors and exits and. And dig it out and put in tame walls and make it nice. Uh, well, nice. we know could be considered a uh, regular uh, well, well window. Uh, the well, the well window. What, what the code is <coughs> that it needs to be 5.7 square feet for um, egress. So what that means is when it's a double hung window, uh, the square footage of the window is cut in half because it only opens halfway. You can get away with smaller casement windows, so the ones that kind of open up like this, because uh, they only need to be 5.7 square feet. So that, that's the requirement. It has to be 5.7 square feet of open space, and it can't be any more than 42 or 48 inches off the ground. Yeah, feet. yeah, it's like 42. And then you have, actually have to have nine square feet of landing space out in the actual um, excavated area. Uh, water supply and distribution system, sanitary or vent drain system, basically any plumbing that you do is going to require a permit unless it's just pull and replace. So, um, if you're remodeling a bathroom, uh, it, if you're only pulling and replacing things, it's kind of a gray area about whether or not you need a permit. Uh, we do a whole lot of uh, packages for just straight kitchens and baths that don't require permits, but if uh, you're putting in a new diverter, like the, where the little knobs are for the shower, then it does technically require a permit, but even we don't pull a permit for that, uh, as long as there's open access to it on the other side. Because if anyone ever says they want to inspect it, we will put in an access panel, they can open it up and they can inspect it, and then, you know, it's not too big of a deal. Um, but as soon as you start messing with, um, well, first of all, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but uh, the differences from commercial code to, to residential code, there's some major differences. And anything over four stories in the state of Virginia is considered a commercial building. So that's important to be aware of, too. <clears throat> but uh, if you're messing with a vent or you're moving any drains or moving the location of anything within a bathroom or within a kitchen, that always does require a permit. You mentioned uh, hot water heaters. Mm -hmm. The permit will have to be pulled by the company who's changing the hot water heater? Uh, yeah, that is, that is the, the code. Um, it's a, a greatly ignored code. However, if, if for instance, we were remodeling, well, we have one in Alexandria where we're remodeling a kitchen and then the water heater's in an illegal place and now we're moving this water heater to be in a legal location, we're going to pull a permit for it because they'll notice it. What if we're just a swap up? 
Yeah, if it's if it's just a swap out, generally we won't. But we also very rarely handle those types of requests just to swap out a water heater, um, even though you know of course we're licensed to do it. But if we're, for instance, like um, moving a portion of a wall or doing something else that requires a permit or putting in recessed lights, and then that inspector sees a brand new water heater, then they'll make us go and pull a plumbing permit for the water heater because they're already there and that's their job, and they can get an extra few bucks for it. But um, generally speaking, yes. Yeah, so those like gray area type things for, you know, the letter of the law is yes, you do need it, but it's, it's oftentimes overlooked. <clears throat> um, electrical wiring. You'll notice there's no qualifications next to electrical wiring. Anytime you're modifying anything with electricity, it does require a permit. The only exception being moving an outlet or a switch up to one foot in any direction or changing fixtures, um, plugs, switches, etc. And anything beyond that, you're moving, you know, you're adding a light, you're adding one outlet, it's going to require a permit. And then not only does it require a permit, but then it requires that whole room or area to be brought up to modern code, too. So if you want to add an outlet in your basement, and your basement only has four outlets in it right now, well, modern code is that it has one every six feet. So now that means to add that one outlet, you're going to have to add all the outlets per code, and then, in addition to that, you might need to upgrade your panel because your panel doesn't have enough room for that to be done correctly. And then your panel might only be 100 amps, so you might need to do a heavy up service to get that up to code. So, you know, it's just one of those things. But also, I mean, in that example, it might sound like a giant pain, but look at what you're getting. Like, if you only have four outlets in your basement or, you know, and they're not grounded or underpowered, you're going to blow up electronics down there. It's not going to work properly. You know, it's, it's never a bad investment to invest in, you know, getting your electrical system done right. Yes. Sorry to no, interrupt so much, but um, a lot of times also I've found that people change out the panel to a 200 amp panel, but the service coming in from the street is just 100 amp. Mm -hmm. So that's when you don't have the yeah. person who knows what they're doing. Right, and, and it's important to, to uh, be aware of this stuff too. Um, we actually put together a booklet of all of these things to watch out for. I, some of you might have seen the email. I let everyone know about it um, a few days ago, a couple days ago maybe. Um, where uh, it's things to watch out for before closing on a house or even making an offer if that's uh, possible. Um, it's a free downloadable PDF from our website. Actually, uh, I, I can, if you remind me later, I can show you how to get to it on the store. Or you can actually order like a printed bound copy for ten dollars to take on to the and to the site um, to and it'll tell you about these things to look for that you know why why waste all of your time and get all the way to have it come up in a home inspection because then by that time you've you know gotten your clients emotionally involved you've done all this work you've negotiated back and forth and then turns out you could have noticed right away that there was a big structural crack between the garage and the house you know. So uh, it's better to identify that stuff before, uh, sooner than later. Um, so at any rate, if you remind me, I'll, I'll show you at the end. Um, fire protection system, uh, mechanical systems or fuel supply systems. You know, of course, any of that stuff is going to need to be permitted. Um, and any equipment regulated by the Virginia Construction Code that doesn't really apply to what you guys do. You know. <coughs> Change of occupancy, this is a big deal in, in uh, D.C. Uh, the change of occupancy is a giant pain in the butt, and it's very popular now. Anybody licensed in D.C.? Okay, a few people. So, uh, change of occupancy, this is one of the things that our company is very good to help with. Uh, we do have a full-time permit expediter. If people want to buy a property in D.C. and it's only um, got one uh, certificate of occupancy and they want to either do uh, split it to condos or, or put it as a rental. There's a lot of bureaucracy that surrounds doing it. It might seem like a simple thing. It is not a simple thing. Um, and uh, it, it's one of the things that we, we do pretty well. Um, uh, whenever there's a change of the occupancy, greater, uh, which requires a greater degree of structural strength, fire protection, means of egress, ventilation, or sanitation, which is pretty much always. If you're, if, if you're trying to take something that wasn't built to be two separate units and hit, build it into two separate units, um, outside of getting it permitted and approved, it's also a lot of work. Um, for instance, you need to have a separate meter for everyone that's, uh, every one of them that are units. 
Um, and uh, you also need to have a third meter if there's any common area between the two. <coughs> for, so a lot of times you have to install a meter just for the little light in the foyer that goes to the two doors <laughs> for the, um, for the uh, occupants. So it's, it's quite a little process. Oh, this thing is really aggressive, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, movement of a lot line that increases the hazard to it. Well, actually, the movement of a lot line period is going to require you to be working with somebody to manage that process. But, um, <laughs> that is, uh, well, I mean, read it. Movement of a lot line that increases the hazard to or decreases the level of safety of an existing building or structure in comparison to the building code under which such a building or structure was constructed. So, um, it, it, Again, you're going to be if you're messing around with pulling around lot lines, you're going to be working with somebody that's going to take care of this anyways. But uh, one thing that this does bring to mind is, um, again, especially in DC, a lot of buildings exist that aren't supposed to exist, as per my example for the Clifton condemned property. So they're grandfathered in now, but they, um, if you start going in and trying to modify them, they're not going to approve it. Uh, so it's just something to be aware of too if you're selling a house and it has something that violates, in Virginia it's very common, it violates the setback requirement. Right? So it's, the house is too close to the street, or too clo the big one now is too close to the septic yard, because those requirements are crazy and tons of houses don't meet those requirements. And then, so it's another problem that comes up sometimes is, well, where else would you like to put this house where it won't be in violation to the setback? But again, it's, it's stuff that's important to know. You're spending a lot of money buying a house if it's got an outstanding violation that it's only grandfathered in by, I, I would want to know that as a homeowner. <laughs> Removal or disturbing of any asbestos containing materials during the construction or demolition of a building or structure, including additions. Um, asbestos is really nasty stuff, so if you see it, you know, we, you always want to get it properly remediated. Um, actually, I think this is, well, this is the second month now, I guess, that we were, um, we used to be licensed to do this remediation, and the insurance policy is just way too much money for it. So even we don't mess with asbestos anymore. So you always want to use uh, an appropriate li license and insure it. It's a separate insurance policy that they have to have to be able to get this stuff uh, uh, remediated. So you, 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 it, you know, again, nasty stuff. You want to make sure that it's, it's remediated properly. It's expensive for a reason. It's a big, big public safety issue. Um, if you disturb asbestos and it gets in the air. I mean, it's, it's really damaging. It causes cancer, of course, and mesothelioma. Yes. Sorry. I have seen in, in my neighborhood that has asbestos flooring, mm -hmm. people remodeling, come in and tear up all the old flooring. Yeah. And yeah. then it's rival, then it's in the air. But once it's redone, once the house is redone and remodeled, nobody knows that. That's true. And also it's important to note, too, that you are allowed to encapsulate asbestos. So you can <coughs> right, you just cover it. I you mean, just but, cover it. But what they've done is scrape actually up. scraped up the old flooring with the asbestos in it. Yeah, that's and that's, at that point they've made it friable and, and created a problem. Mm -hmm. But the new homeowner coming in, there's no way to test for that once it's done. That's true, it. but it does get in the ventilation systems, right. and it's, yeah, it's it's a big concern. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk to us uh, for a new realtor? I'm not sure what asbestos looks like. I mean, what. <laughs> Uh, I'm not stupid, but what, what sure. things should I be aware of? Well, uh, the Sorry. most common around here is the 9x9 nine nine tile, or 9x9 nine nine, like vinyl, vinyl looking tiles, okay. and those are usually asbestos tiles, um, or white wrapping around um, uh, hot water lines is, you know, uh, asbestos, it can be asbestos. Or furnace exhaust. Yeah, furnace exhaust is a good <coughs> example. All the ducts work in green wrapping. Right? Asbestos is white, so. <coughs> Now, how about on the outside of a house? There's some houses that still have asbestos. Oh, the side. Side. Right. The side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, actually, that's not as straightforward. There are a number of different kinds of asbestos uh, tile sidings. Um, and what? If they, uh, somebody could buy that house as long as they what? Don't paint it with, a, with anything? Lawnmower? Yeah, lawnmower? Well, the, um, the, the siding that's asbestos-based, as well as the vinyl tile, 
And if that's what they're scraping up, it's not ideal, but it's also not as bad because it's still technically <coughs> encapsulated within the product. Because it's like, because the asbestos is basically like a powdery, dusty type of a substance. Okay. And so when it's in something like a, a vinyl or an asphalt, mm -hmm. it's not going to just pop out into the air. Where it's, where it's really bad is where it's, you know, on the hot water pipes where if you touch it and dust comes off, that's... <coughs> But I mean, you're, you're going to have a hard time getting dust out of a vinyl pile. It kind of looks like a cast on a broken something. Yeah, that's know? a good and point. It, it, it kind of looks like kind of plaster with Plastic, plastic, plastic. with, um, it's usually got wires or something in it too for... There's a community that has the HVAC ducts wrapped in mm -hmm. asbestos. Yeah. That doesn't smell good. Yeah. But it's not a problem until where they cut it for the vents. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Be Arlington Falls Church. Okay. Yeah. Should I really say? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us here. Um, Greenbrier. They don't have any basements there. Are they Levitt houses? And it's in the. It might be. I'm not sure. It's in the. It's in the. Uh, you know, but what, I sold the house there, and they just said to seal it where they cut for the vents, and just they they came in and checked everything, and then they just sealed it, and it was it was fine. And Jeremy, actually, let's uh, let's add that to the book, asbestos, and then so we'll we'll update the book that's on there with some examples of it. Um, the letter of the law is all asbestos is really bad. I'm just giving you an example about the, the encapsulation process of it because if it's not airborne, it's not you know. So as long as it doesn't get into the air, then it's and that, that's why you're allowed to lay carpet over it because if you lay carpet over it, you know, it's not going to create dust and so forth. But there are asbestos flooring that causes a lot of uh, uh, a lot of dust that when it's formed to <laughs> yeah, and also ceiling tile but you don't see that ceiling tile. And, yeah. yeah the ceiling tile oh for drop ceilings and basements that's a good point oh, I was yeah. thinking that's only for commercial but it's not you see the oh, drop ceilings drop and basements. are they used yeah. to the small ones or? Uh, yeah, again what? it depends on they before 1970 it, or I think it was 72 or something like that they used it in everything like it's mm -hmm. It's in it all sorts of different things. Yeah. I mean, it's a great product for a number of reasons, except for that it kills you. <laughs> <laughs> That's like problem. Okay, so maybe this is a rabbit trail, but are you going to be discussing how the lane piping and how to? Um, I, I can. It's not in the. It's not in the list, but um, polybutylene piping. Um, what does that look like? Great. <laughs> no. Yeah, the polybutylene piping. It's it. Yeah. It's not going to die from it. It's not an issue. It's just a way to get some money from your sellers. Yeah, it's, a, it's a few grand to get a new main line ran in from the, the uh, road to the um, to the house, where you'll see it a lot. And if they know about it, you can get a few grand to get Dominion it. Power yeah. Insurance. They have poly pipe insurance for like five dollars a month. A thousand dollars a month. Five 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 dollars a month. Oh. <laughs> really? Dominion okay. Virginia Power has a lot of different insurance, but one, I think it's five dollars a month for poly pipes. Really? Or at least the main line running into the house. Maybe not throughout the house, but the main line. Because the warranty companies don't care about the main line coming into the house. Well, it's right. because it's the most expensive. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and if you know that they have it, again, it's not anything other than to get some money for your you don't think it's that bad. If it's been sitting for years and years, you would be like, what the heck? I, I wouldn't replace it in my own house unless I had really? to. I'd take the three grand. Um, been permitted. Uh, so the easiest way is to call the county or city building department and ask them. Um, it, most of them, you're going to have a hard time spending on the phone to try to get these types of answers. So it's good to either look it up online or to go down to the county office. Um, they'll give you a list of all the different permits, and sometimes that's a little bit difficult for uh, uh, for you to recognize uh, what is and isn't actually permitted. Now, a lot of this stuff is it's great to find out if if the wiring is is up to code or was permitted properly. But the one type thing you always want to do it for is if there's an addition that was built on, a clear, visible addition. You really want to check and make sure if that was permitted or not. Because if it wasn't permitted, it might violate it, like worst case scenario, which is, isn't all that uncommon. It wasn't permitted, it violates the setback requirement, and now that, you know, 3,000 square foot house you just sold is really ending up being, you know, 2,500 square feet because it has an unpermitted addition and now the county's going to make you take it down. So. You know, that's something that you, 
always want to look into is if there's an addition that looks like it might have not been permitted. Um, so can we just see it says closed permit, correct? Closed, you go yes. Online? Yes, and closed permits are obviously the best. Um, if it at least had footing inspections or electrical inspections or rough inspections, still bad, but at least you know that you're not going to have to tear it down more than likely. Um, and again, we have a, a staff permit expeditor that deals with all of this stuff. On our website, I'll show you later, um, we charge $105 an hour to figure out all of this stuff for you. So, it, it, and, and being professionals, we will actually look into it and tell you what all was permitted and what was unpermitted. <laughs> that is a third option that's not on here. But um, for, for anything that you can't understand or you can't figure out and you want to be able to advise your clients properly, not just us, but other companies offer solutions where you know, they can go in and do the research for you. Um, and in those types of circumstances, especially if something doesn't look like it was built right, which we'll go over in a minute, it, it helps to, to get it figured out properly. Yeah. Did you have any luck with calling when counties come out and like, fail a deck or something? If you have to call co code enforcement, and that's um, what we'll call the nuclear option. <laughs> if you call code enforcement, yes, they, they generally will come out and take a look at whatever violation you have. Um, uh, but, um, you know, then, now you're, the like code enforcement is difficult to deal with because they're going to come out and if they see a violation, they're going to want to, you, you no longer control the process. So you're going to, you're going to probably burn your deal to the ground if you call code enforcement out there because they're going to, whatever the remedial work is going to be done, that violation is now going to be tied to the person that owns the house and it's going to need to be, um, remediated properly and the, um, and you know the, the process takes a long time you know, to, to get everything taken care of a lot of times. Like for a, for a deck, if you call code enforcement on somebody about a deck and then it turns out it wasn't permitted and it's not supposed to be there, well now that ha the house is going to have the, the deck torn down. Whereas it's not if a you're, safe deck and nobody will agree that, I mean, nobody it's just an example. will acknowledge that it's not a safe deck. Oh, uh, yes. If, I mean, again, I'm just here to give you facts. How you negotiate deals and what you do is entirely up to you. But keep in mind, though, for even safe, unsafe decks, we can go in for way less money because we have an engineer, and we can have the engineer propose remedial work to be able to build this deck up to modern code, whereas code enforcement will just make them tear it down. So, and that's just one example. So the short answer is yes, you can. And, um, but it's... The, How much an hour is that? What, code enforcement? <laughs> no, if, if you guys come out and give us, give recommendations on how to fix it. Uh, it depends on what it is. It's, um, I mean, all of the rates are on the store, from the store page from the website. But uh, if you just want us to come and take a look and give you an idea, see, getting an idea of what's going on as opposed to, like, getting an actual written solution for it is two different prices. If we're just coming out to take a look at it, you know, myself, Jeremy, or one of our other experts will come out there for 150 bucks and take a look at it and tell you, yeah, this is going to need to be torn down, or yeah, we think we can maybe be able to get it fixed. So that's not too expensive, but the minimum charge for an engineer is $500. So having an engineer come out and take a look at it and get a stamped remedial scope of work together is, you know, probably going to end up being... You know, thousand, couple thousand dollars. Yes. You were saying that to look for you guys, you got to permit one hundred and five dollars per hour. What's the average time that it takes? About three hours. Okay. Almost always, we charge three hours okay. because we're in these. It, unless you need it done right now. Mm -hmm. If you need it done right now, now we have to devote somebody's full time yeah. right now to go in and doing it, and then it's going to be more. Okay. But if we're just doing it the next time we're in the office, anyways, mm -hmm. then yeah, it's only a few, about three hours. Yeah. Is the FIDO website accurate yeah. for Fairfax yeah. County? So what is so <coughs> Excuse my ignorance, because I don't have a lot of experience. But to me, did you just look at the final website? No, certainly. The, the, the $105 an hour is more, it, it's just the complex stuff. Like, we get calls from a realtor that says, there's four pages of permits on this house that was built in the 60s. I have no idea which permit applies to what, and, you know, I, I, they don't have copies of the plat, so they can't see. So. Yes, yeah, so you can look at the FIDO website and it'll tell you what permits are closed, but it only but goes back But I don't know that everything's on FIDO. Not even close. Because we've what found other, other websites with yeah. FIDO permits as well. There's, there's, there's FIDO and there's another one. FIDO is the more updated one. Um, but again, it's not it's not all inclusive. Is that and it more only updated goes, than FIDO? What's that? Is that website more updated than FIDO? Well, this is going to take you to both. So it, this is just like the main page that says, you know, here are the resources for you to be able to find this stuff out for yourself. Um, but you're right, they only went back, 
Well, first of all, the FIDO stuff, I think, is only since about 2004. I mean, it's really not that old. And then the old online system goes back to like 1995 or something. It, it, so at any rate, this isn't a silver bullet of figuring everything out. The only way to really get it figured out is to have hire somebody you guys. You hire <laughs> us or someone else like us to go down into the county and do the research and pull it and figure everything out for you. And that's why I don't really suggest that you just figure out if, you know, this outlet was installed correctly. It's more important, like, was this addition going to be, uh, is this addition built properly? And because um, that's real square footage for the house. You know, that changes the value of the property significantly if it needs to be torn down or even remediated. Any other questions with this one? Okay. Warning signs for unpermitted work. Uh, the best way to identify unpermitted work, of course, is to verify with the permitting office. And if you can't do that, or you don't have time to do that, any partially finished or unfinished remodeling work uh, is going to be uh, a big red flag that something is incorrect. Uh, lack of GFCI outlets in kitchens remodeled after 1987. So back to your point, that, that is the... Correct here. What does it say? Here is the same thing, but 1987, 1975, but it's outlet. Oh, no, that's the next one. That's for bathrooms. Yes. I know, but here is the same thing. What do you mean? Look. <laughs> it says kitchens on both lines. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> thank you. It's funny to talk this class with that school this quite a few times, nobody's caught that. I'm a professor. I see everything. Well, let me know if you find anything else. Yeah, about. Which one's 75? Uh, no, it's correct on the slide. It's just not correct in the syllabus. So it is uh, a remodel after 1987 for kitchens or after 75 in bathrooms. Um, well, and it's, it's just a, a red flag that something wasn't done right, you know. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't done right. Um, but if you see six brand new can lights in that kitchen, and you see, you know, no GFCI in the kitchen too, then you can be relatively assured that those lights are wired to an existing circuit in the kitchen, not ran all the way down to the panel and that no permit was pulled. Like nine out of ten times would be the case, if not ten. Um, uh, poor quality workmanship or anything that doesn't look quite right and that's a very important one like doesn't look yeah. quite right everything that's done that's permitted that looks fine like, yeah. if it look if it looks even a little weird probably something is, is uh, yeah a little cockeyed or you know talking about removing parts of walls yeah, a lot of times you'll see stuff that was modified and then the four floor slopes or you know there's uh, other things like drywall cracks again it's all in this book that you can download for free from our website too. But what I see is permits pulled and yet still stuff looks yeah. not quite right. And I <laughs> go on the slope. site and it's all put, pulled and it's all, and I'm like, who paid off who? Well, Did I say that? yeah, I mean, we, we see it, but it's the exception rather than the rule that, if, if, that things were permitted and still done incorrectly. What I can say is that this area, as many of you have noticed, if, if you've been here for a while, is that um, there's been a lot of money dumped into this area in the last couple decades. And prior to that, we were really looking as closely at things. So, like, for instance, the entire city of Reston, you know, a lot of that stuff is built not great. And it's because they just weren't as on top of their game as they are now as far as it relates to public safety and law enforcement. Um, so, yeah, it does happen, but it's, it's a lot less common now where you'd see a permit and something's still done wrong. I mean, they, they miss very little these days. Yeah. Um, in order to remediate, like, for radar and gas, especially now in Loudoun County, Fairfax County, when they're, you know, they're high levels, do they need a permit? The companies that remediate, you know, they have to drill down on the ground and all that? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll need a permit. That is a, that's more of a specialty type of a trade. Uh, to be able to do that, but yes, yeah, so they definitely require a permit. When you no, I couldn't find any way that radon mitigation companies are licensed. Um, there's national standards, but there's no licensing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and, and again, this is a specialty trade. If we, came, if we came across it, we would just hire the companies that... Uh, Jeremy, do you know any radon? I'm not familiar. Yeah, it, it's, it, <coughs> we would just hire a professional uh, company to be able to do it, but um, anytime you drill into the ground, <laughs> or dig a hole in the ground. Um, a lot of times they're just using the existing, the existing drain field in the sun pump. So. Mm -hmm. If they're doing that, then then I don't believe that it would need to be permitted. Yeah, but, but they're again, going this, through a foundation. 
If they're modifying, if they go through the foundation, then then by the letter of the law, yes, it would require a permit. Now, would they actually probably pull it if that was all they're doing? Almost certainly not. Newer homes have a passive have passive system, mm -hmm. so you just have to attach a fan if you're exactly. operating on. Yeah, but when they, whenever they're attaching it, they're just taking it out, like by the window, and it's still coming in. No, they no, no, they're not supposed to. can't have it under a window. It's got it to be above, above the roof line. Right, like a certain yeah. amount. Yeah, it can't. Yes. All right, so what happens if your buyers buy a house with unpermitted work? Um, properties purchased with unpermitted work transfer the violation to the new owners, um, making them responsible for remedial, remedial work and proper permitting. This may involve partial or complete demolition of unpermitted areas, exploratory work to verify that unpermitted scope is up to code, fines, and even condemnation of the structure. So, um, <laughs> so buying unpermitted, uh, is, having your clients buy per, uh, houses that have unpermitted work is just like um, uh, HOA associations and stuff with outstanding violations, they stick with the property. You can always try to go back and sue people, but that's more or less you're gonna be stuck with whatever you bought that uh, still has these types of violations. Um, and then the remedial work for it is often very, very challenging. If code enforcement gets involved, then remedial work is, ex is exceptionally challenging because now, you know, a company like ours is going to come in and try to fix everything. Well, they get cranky when things weren't done the way that they wanted to in the first place. So they'll, you know, oftentimes make you rip out a lot of stuff to take a look at absolutely everything. So that means you have a finished house. And uh, the example I always give is when you purchase a house that was flipped. Right? So we do a ton of work for, um, if you're familiar with Express Home Buyers, we do um, a ton of work for their, their uh, flips. And because we are fully licensed, everything that they do is fully permitted and fully inspected. But, and, and as well as the other investors we work with, like um, uh, you know, the Leo Pereja team or uh, uh, Rob Chavez and Kaza and so forth. They'll, they'll generally be all permitted, but the smaller guys that are going in and flipping these houses, a lot of times they'll do all kinds of work that required permits, not permit any of it, and put it on, on uh, to, be, to be purchased. So they'll have panels without stickers, they'll have a whole house rewired, they'll have new plumbing, new electrical. So what happens when, you, when somebody buys a house and these violations come up? Well, now you have to hire a company like ours that holds all these licenses to be able to pull the proper permits for it. And then they'll oftentimes make you expose everything. Well, and, and for good reason, too, because they'll, they'll have buried junction boxes in the wall. They'll have circuits spliced together. They'll have, you know, all kinds of things just done as quick and dirty as possible. And that's, you know, stuff that they want to identify. So you'll end up going into a fully finished house, you know, a lot of times nicely redone, ripping out tile, cabinets, granite, you know, absolute drywall, everything to expose it all and put it back together. Um, I mean, it's not uncommon for us to have twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar bills for people to go in and look at and remediate unpermitted work. Plus the hundred five dollars an hour for fi fixing permit issues to go look something up three hours. When you have to go and fight a whole house of violations, I mean, it's it's unbelievable how much time is spent getting that stuff fixed. And that's before even any hammers are swung. So it, it definitely adds up pretty quickly. Uh, so moral of the story is check and see if there's a permit. Um, so when you have a job like that, like what generally caused it? Like who who requested the county to come out and see if it was permitted? Well, it depends. It is the is the short answer. We get a lot of them from um, uh, well from the realtors, and then it comes from yeah. So we we don't really know how it came up. We don't really ask a lot of times like how it came up that this is now an issue for them. Um, a lot of times what will happen is they'll call, um, like, they'll try to get something actually done correctly. Like, they want to install six recess lights, and they'll call an electrician and have the electrician come out. And then the electrician will say, wow, none of this is wired correctly. And then the inspector will see it, and then they'll say, wow, this whole house is remodeled. And it doesn't look like we have any open permits since 1975. So, you know, maybe we're going to look into this a little bit more. Or... Um, you know, it comes up on home inspections too. Actually, that's what we get it the most from, is it'll come up on a home inspection, something is unpermitted, and then you'll have, you know, a, a zealous buyer that will call code enforcement, or, you know, will we'll in some other way raise the red flags, and now this seller, instead of netting proceeds at the end of the sale, now they're gonna be 
paying out the nose and potentially losing a client or a buyer off of it because it all needs to be remediated. And um, uh, as you guys know, if you find material defects in properties, that you'll have to disclose it to the next buyer. So that means that you're fixing it. <laughs> you know, you're fixing it or you're selling the house as a distressed property. Yeah. Some of the banks for their foreclosure properties that they're selling, they'll have a paragraph in there that prohibits the buyer from bringing any problems to the attention of code enforcement, or county, or... Yeah, I wasn't familiar with that, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, I wonder why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're running a little late here, because, and I appreciate all the questions. You know, we're we're here as a resource to, to help you with everything you need, but we're going to try to burn through uh, the rest of this. Cause I'm sure some of you have to have to run. Um, the commercial versus rented residential, as I mentioned, anything over four stories is considered to be a commercial property, even if it's a residential building. Um, condos and townhomes can be considered commercial properties if they exceed that requirement. Um, Potential scope of remodeling projects is limited for commercial properties. And this is another big point when it comes to open concepts or opening up walls. So just because you're, uh, somebody says, well, the other unit in this building has this open concept kitchen, doesn't mean that you can do it. Because the building can be configured differently. And even still, a lot of times, those people that did that didn't pull the permits. Condos are very hesitant, I guess would be the best word the nicest word, to allow people to go in and do interior alterations that involve moving or removing walls <coughs> within, the, within the condos. Because, again, it's a matter of public safety. These buildings will have, you know, hundreds or thousands of ha inhabitants. And, um, you know, we don't have a lot of time for examples, but just trust me when I say that you start taking out walls in a, in a building like that, you can cause a lot of trouble and a lot of structural issues. So you don't have the kind of freedom. Really, all you own in there is the, is the air. Um, you, can, exactly. you, can pull, you can pull cabinets, you can change flooring, you can do that kind of stuff. But we've had clients where they want to put in a few extra light fixtures and they can't because they only have 100 amp service ran to their unit. And they can't upgrade their service because every unit in the whole building has 100 amp service. So oftentimes you can't even bring it to modern code because there, there's not enough electricity for that to be done. So there's a lot of limitations with condos in addition to all the other limitations that you all know about already. So um, estimating remodeling costs, we're going to just go through this really quickly. Um, so we have these little cards that we made up. I'm going to pass this block around. And uh, basically what it shows you on the back is this. So when somebody says, how much does it cost to do X, Y, Z? These are quick reference cards that allow you to do quick, uh, quick, uh, quick estimating on uh, what certain projects are going to cost. Now, understand that these are... Uh, estimates and the, the numbers might change and so forth. Um, also, I'm going to pass around, we're still working on these. These are, um, these are uh, prototypes, <coughs> as it were, for our design packages. We have standard packages for a lot of for kitchens and baths, as well as exteriors and so forth, that um, you know, have set pricing as well. Uh, so that makes it a little bit easier to estimate things and then also show people what they get for the prices that you're estimating them at. What is a finished basement, real quick? A finished basement, in the example on the board, is a finished, I think it says with a half bathroom. Oh, no, it doesn't, but it, it is. So it, it's uh, 500 square feet of basement being finished. Including, including HVAC systems. Including HVAC. Uh, with, uh, <clears throat> if it's already plumbed for a bathroom, to have the bathroom finished. 15,000, including the bathroom finished. Including? Uh, but it's only 500 it's square feet. Yeah. Well, it's because it's only 500 square feet. Like most bathrooms are, or most basements are going to be 1,000 square feet or more out here. <coughs> yeah, but in D.C., you know, or whatever. And again, it's just a starting point. But um, a lot of basements are going to require more work than that because, again, you might need to upgrade the panel. You might need to do a heavy up to get enough electricity in there. Um, a lot of houses aren't rough for bathrooms. So, But if somebody goes into it and they, you see that they're in a 1,000 square foot basement, then you can tell them, well, it'll probably be about $30,000 to, to get it all finished out. But if you're so that's in a, one big room yeah. and, the, and the bathroom. Well, no, I mean, again, these are just like okay. ballpark numbers, but um, it, that's, that's, you know, putting in the insulation, framing the, the perimeter, you know, framing out the little space for the bathroom, doing a very uh, basic builder grade, you know, basement bathroom, and, uh, you know, installing the fixtures for it and so forth. Um, 
include all my videos, right? Uh, yes, it includes materials. <laughs> now, um, again, I think we ran out of both. I, can't, I don't have enough. They're just okay. examples. Um, okay. if, if somebody wants to keep them, you can. I just don't have enough. For okay. there's, a, there's a few more here. Um, just real quick, I'm going to talk about how to evaluate the, the ROI for the construction projects. So um, these are a little bit older of uh, older of uh, CMAs, but basically you just want to look at what a renovated property is going to look like. Um, and that's why we have the uh, PowerPoint available for download on the website too, if you want to pull it down. I mean, you're welcome to take pictures too, but. <laughs> We're also going to have this video at some point. Um, so for the ROI on the properties, you just figure out what the property condition is now versus what a fixed up version of that property would sell for. And then you look at what the estimate is to, to get the remedial work done. You can use the card for quick reference to just get you in the ballpark. Or um, we actually uh, will come out and do this analysis for you to give you um, exactly what we think should be done and what, because we do tons of these. Um, the scope that we think that should be done, and uh, it's a $150 charge, and then you'll know exactly what it's going to cost, and you'll have the professional opinion from our team about what should be done to maximize this dollar value for your sellers, and um, you know, figure out what they can do that's going to net them more money if they have the money to spend. Um, just a few quick examples. This is exact same property with a new kitchen, nets the seller another $40,000. These were actual numbers from sales and from comps that we did the projects for um, a few years ago. Uh, uh, same exact house here, new carpet, paint, kitchen and floor, um, $5,500 and netted the seller another $24,000. Yeah, when did it sell the previous time? It depends on the market. Too. Yeah, no, no, no. These, this, we did this at that time. Like This is what we did for these people four years ago or three years ago or something, whenever this was ran. So the, that comp was within six months, whatever the comp rules are. So we also, um, I mean, we do tons of work with realtors. So. The price of oh. What's that? The price of It's the same house or the same yeah. model? <laughs> No, no, no. This, these are just the same, the same exact house. This is a reversed, a mirror image of the other house yeah. in the neighborhood. But for all intents and purposes, the it's basically lot. the same. Different house. lot. Different lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are other things. Go back to a busy street. There's that all that kinds is true. of other factors. There are all kinds of other factors. Yeah. That, that's absolutely true. But you know, everyone in this room is, is qualified to do CMAs and to know exactly what what the property would sell for if it was fixed up versus what it would sell for as is, right? I never know the answer to that. You don't? You don't nope. know what it's going to sell up fixed nope. up? After 26 years, no. I, I just say, you know, honestly, it, it, it will make it more desirable for more people and it will sell quicker. But to tell them a dollar figure? Oh, no, I'm not saying that you would ever do that. That would be a horrible idea. But you would be able to, you would be able to at least advise them Well, they always ask that. that. How much more am I going to get if I, if I fix it up? Versus if I don't fix it up, they yeah. they always ask that. I mean, and, and you know, you, you so generally don't want to get yourself. It'll faster, and it'll it'll yeah. attract more buyers if you do fix it up. But I can't, I I can never give them a dollar amount. No, but if you have one that's fixed up and it's the exact same house, I mean, you could say, what, but no, it's not the exact same. But you can say like this one that was fixed up sold for this. I, I don't know. Like, that, that, this is out of my ballpark, out of my arena. I don't, I don't know how to negotiate deals. That's, that's uh, for you guys. Um, so a few few other examples, but anyways, that's the kind of stuff that you can uh, uh, present to, to sellers if you'd like. Um, so in summary, we went over the basics of contractors, the different levels, uh, when permits are required, uh, how to check if work was permitted. Um, you can download that from our website. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Actually, um, since we're low on time, I will stay and show people how to navigate the site um, if you want to stay for a few minutes. Otherwise, you can just go to the uh, order services tab and then you can click on the um, investor, or actually it's just under the investor link and then you can click and download it. Um, <clears throat> estimating construction costs and uh, potentially determining ROI. <laughs> Sorry about speeding through the last of that there, just wanted to make sure we got through all the material. 
Um, does anyone have any other questions for me right now? Yeah. Um, so I was in a class at one point where somebody was saying you could permit like after the work is complete. Is that different from code enforcement? Like, can you, can you actually have them come and like, you know, of course they would have to inspect and stuff, but can they give you a permit like for something that was already completed before? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what we do when we get the remedial work done. Um, but we actually issue our new permits under our name because the last thing we want is for us to have, you know, a permit that shows a history of us not doing what we're supposed to do on record with the county. We would actually go out there if it wasn't permitted. If it wasn't permitted at all, we'll go out there, we'll pull a new, new permit, and we'll say, hey, you know, they, they know us. So we'll say, hey, this is what we're dealing with. Um, what do you want us to do to get this up to code? And they'll say, all right, tear down the drywall. You know, we want an electrical uh, permit, we want a building permit, we want a plumbing permit, whatever the case may be. We'll pull all the permits that they want. We'll go in, we'll do the remedial work, and then we'll close it back up and uh, put the final inspection and close out. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, what if it's like, done correctly? I mean, it does. Well, the, the, the D.C., the Maryland, Virginia building, building departments aren't, aren't exactly very trusting. So <laughs> okay. they, they, you, can, you can tell them that it's done correctly, but they're, they're more in the... Of the camp of uh, we don't believe you show us. <laughs> so if it was done correctly, we would still have to open it up and, and show them how it was done correctly. Like open all the drywall or just like. That, that's why we meet out with the inspectors and it's whatever they require us to do. It depends on the situation and it depends on the inspector. If someone, if someone comes to you with a, with a piece of land and want to give the design of the house to the person who wants to do it, are you are you on I mean, we have to do from A to Z completion of the I mean, brand new construction of the house from A to Z. We are licensed to build houses, and actually, we're doing our first one right now. Um, but it's not really our our bread and butter. We're doing one right now because somebody didn't use our book and, and bought a house that didn't have any footings on it anywhere. So. Um, <laughs> It, it needed to be bulldozed anyway, so now we're, we're building a house on it. Um, but no, that's, I mean, we'll, we'll look at it, but we're not usually the best fit for building a new house because there's other companies that have better economies of scale to be able to do that efficiently. This particular circumstance, we're going to take care of it because we're already involved anyways, and it just makes sense to keep us involved to, to finish it out. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned uh, insurance. Uh, sometimes even calling the insurance companies for uh, the general contractors' um, insurance. Would it be the certificate of insurance that I would ask for? Yeah, okay. yeah just their certificate of insurance, and it'll give you all the information. Okay. And uh, you know, if you have questions, and, and just as a general resource, if any of you have any questions about anything that we've discussed today, or come up, uh, or come across anything in the future. Feel free to give us a call, email us. Uh, we're, we're always very on top of that contact us section under the website. You can fill anything out. Um, or call and ask for me, Jeremy, Judy, or uh, Sabrina directly. We're, we're all happy to help with any of these questions. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.